Hello, I am Gordon Buchanan and welcome to Beneath the Baobab, the conservation and communities podcast from JAMA International. In this series, we're exploring the vital connection between communities and wildlife in conservation projects in Africa and all around the world. This time, a conversation that stretches across the continents, but is rooted in Zimbabwean conservation and community-based natural resource management, also known as CBNRM. I'm talking to pioneers and practitioners of this movement, Dr. Brian Child and Dr. Shylock Muengwa. Brian is a Zimbabwean conservationist and associate professor at the University of Florida. Brian was one of the founding figures in conceiving and developing CBNRM. And he has a passionate commitment to the rights and well-being of rural people. Brian also ran a pioneering CBNRM programme called Campfire. Shylock has an astonishing breadth of experience across Zimbabwe's agriculture, food security and livelihood sector. And he is the Managing Director at the Centre for Impact Evaluation and Research Design. He is also CBNRM Manager for Resource Africa, Southern Africa. Together, Brian and Shalot's work on community governance and reinstating rights through participatory democracies is showing incredible, exciting new avenues for the future of rebuilding social capital, value chains and conservation in communities that live side by side with wildlife. Let's meet Brian and Shylock beneath the Baobab. Shylock, Brian, thank you for joining me. So we're holding this conversation online. I am currently in Glasgow. The sun is shining. Shylock, where, where are you at the moment? I'm in Arare. It's a bit cloudy. We've got in some showers. It's a beautiful summer here in Zimbabwe. And Brian, you're in Florida, so you're out kind of swimming with manatees and enjoying cocktails like everyone else in, in Florida. Yeah, that was last week. <laughs> Unfortunately, this week's at the office. But I, I think our weather's just like April in Harare at the moment. It's beautiful. How did you both meet? How did you sort of begin this collaboration? 2007. I was working on a little project in, at the University of Zimbabwe, and I happened to be sending a lot of emails discussing conservation issues, moderating the debates around sustainable use at the time. And that's when I started corresponding with Brian Child, learned about his fantastic work that he was planning with young African professionals. And that led to a trip, me flying to South Africa to meet Brian for the first time. And yeah, I think the rest spinned off quite well. That's why we are still Marines in arms, almost a decade and a half onwards. Shylock described you as Marines in arms, Brian. Can you expand on that? I'll get to that. Yeah. So, so I was a <laughs> practitioner and I worked for the Wildlife Agency in Zimbabwe on private land and I ran campfire. And then I also worked in Zambia on in the Luango Valley park management and communities. And then I went to university and I was concerned that we were sitting in our lab studying stuff. So I made a huge effort to do two things. One is to make sure my students work in the field. And the other is to make sure international students and Africans work together. And so I take quite big research groups in the field in Namibia, Botswana, etc., Zambia. And we just started working with CBNRM across the region. And the reason we called the Marines is because sometimes people are a bit picky about accommodation and stuff. And this group, it doesn't matter. As long as you get the data and you work with the people, if you have to camp, if you have to get up early, if to work late, it doesn't matter. <laughs> because we like to get on with not too much talk, a bit more action than talk, actually. Uh, Greta Thornburg's right. It's blah, 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 and no action. And, and <laughs> we're trying to be different. So you mentioned CBNRM, so that's Community-Based Natural Resource Management. Can you just sort of explain what the principles of CBNRM are? Yes, I, I'll do it from, from two aspects. One is economic and one is governance. So 
economically, when white people settled Africa, essentially they stuffed the drylands or the savannas full of cattle. So you're turning grass into meat, which is really an inefficient use of these water-limited environments. So what we found out is that, A, a multi-species indigenous wildlife is much better for the environment. And number two, it doesn't just produce meat. It produces multiple products, meat, tourism, hunting, ivory, rhino horn, and therefore it makes wildlife two to four times more profitable per hectare. So we, we developed a new model. We worked out that we could make more money, more ecologically sustainable. We could produce more livelihood from less environment using wildlife. But of course, most of the land is owned by African communities. So the second aspect is how do we empower, give communities rights, governance capacity to manage the wildlife as a business so that it benefits their livelihoods. So those are the two components of community-based natural resource management, which is a funny term, but that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. And and Shylock, are you from a city or are you from a rural part of of Africa? I'm from both. (laughs) We live dual lives, so we've got a place in the city and in and, and the rural home. But more importantly, I think, as, as Brian said, CBNRM, it's about people. It's about the power to decide. It's about democracy. It's about recognizing that people have a right to make choices. And, and, and for us, as practitioners, it's been that opportunity to listen, but just to hear what their long-term visions and plans are. And those plans are mostly uh, premised around resources that surround them. So, Gordon, what what we're learning is that rural communities have got very little social capital. And when you trace it back, you'll see that they got absolutely messed up by the slave trade. Then they got messed up by colonialism. Mm -hmm. And now in the dual kind of what I call an extractive environment, they also get marginalized, so they have no rights. Mm-hmm. So essentially the rural people are being sucked dry and marginalized with no rights, no nothing. So yeah. CBRM is a process almost of giving people back what we think are their legitimate rights to land, wildlife, dignity, yeah. ability to cooperate. I think these marginalized rural communities have been seriously messed up by what we might call development or progress. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I think the the world view of Africa tends to be kind of this in this colonial or slavery context. We think in fairly recent terms when we think of of Africa and Africa African communities. For Shylock, you work directly with communities. How would you describe the mood pre two thousand and seven when you if you were speaking to rural communities about their kind of level of decision making that they had over their resources? Pre-2007, I, I'd done most of my work in, in Zimbabwe. It wasn't a good time during that period because a lot of things were happening. The currency crisis, usurpation of powers by several uh, rural district councils that were sort of curtailing these rights for communities. There was a lot of centralization at the time, pre-2007, and I'm being specific to Zimbabwe per se, and of course, you get a lot of people complaining and so on. But what we see in that, even when you read through the literature, which is what others also experienced, is people tend to talk to you about what we call the key moments. And for them, the key moments is what was established in the initial days, for example, 87, 90s, that about where this concept was purely being grounded. So they got hold of the concepts and they they understood the power of devolution, power of making decisions, voting for things, and so on. So they clearly understood that. So when we get to 2007, the stories that people will tell you is we need to go back to that period. Things used to work well for us. And probably this is the time (laughs) that, that Brian was still driving around in the Land Rovers and so on giving people money, helping them exercise their rights, all from Bay Bridge through up to the Zambezi Valley. It wasn't a situation of all hope is lost. There was always that hope that the original principles of Campfire will be reinstated and communities will get to work again. If you go back before that, when I started, 
local people saw wildlife as a symbol of colonial oppression because it had been taken away from them. They had no idea what its value. They wanted to get rid of it. They saw anyone wearing a wildlife khaki uniform as their enemy. Mm -hmm. I was in a community with the other Marine, Rogers Lubila, about two years ago in Zambia. And what you have there is communities moving their houses and accommodation to make way for wildlife. Even though they've got minimal rights because they're anticipating wildlife being valuable in the future. In Southern Africa, you have, instead of the, the communities being highly opposed to conservation, they are now extremely supportive and they, through the community leaders network, they argue about use in the European Parliament, in America, at CITES, in IUCN. What Shylock is showing is that the communities in Zimbabwe were empowered and then through the Mugabe regime they were disempowered again. But they so much like being empowered that they are seriously fighting to get those rights back mm. again. And I think kind of the sort of view has, has been certainly, uh, for me as a wildlife filmmaker, you know, you think that there is of the wild parts of the world and that there's a kind of human landscape. But of course, increasingly, especially in Africa, the future has to be about coexistence and sustainability. So landscapes that can support wildlife, nature and people. The world simply isn't big enough to sort of set aside these kind of wild, wild parts of the, the world. I, I think I think we can be far more proactive than coexistence. What we are doing is turning wildlife into an engine for economic development. Mm -hmm. By making the environment more wild, you can make the economy bigger. And that's simply something that Westerners can't understand because they have a different mind map. Mm -hmm. But you'll see in Southern Africa, we've probably got six times as much wildlife as we had 30 years ago. And we're doing that because it's making four times as much money. So by commercializing wildlife, we're actually resulting in more of it. And if we're going to conserve 30% of the planet, yeah. we have to do it that way. We don't have public funding or philanthropy to fund the billion and a half people that they're going to kick off the 30% of land. You're both clearly passionate about those communities, about sort of wild Southern Africa. Shylock, is that something sort of that's in your blood? Is that how you grew up? Absolutely. For me, it's been sort of a continued growth of my passion. One thing that I saw during the time, uh, Brian knows uh, the area where I come from, is was the, the decimation of wildlife around the peripheries of Harare. That land has been converted completely into agriculture, but very non-productive, non-profitable. Families can't feed themselves. Mm -hmm. So rejoining the conservation field itself has been quite a, a rediscovery for myself. And, and I'm sure, Gordon, you've traveled, you realize that you have to travel long distances to get to mm -hmm. where the wildlife is. Yeah, that's why when we get an opportunity, we, we just disappear in the bush and spend a lot of time there, immerse ourselves with the communities, learn what's happening, and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but much of rural Zimbabwe is transformed and not in a productive way. The agriculture is actually poor. The soils have degraded, and this is different from what I remember from my early days as a young boy starting primary school and all that. Yeah. It's obviously, it's not just a, an African issue. Just before Christmas, I flew to Brazil. It's a place that I visited sort of back in 1992. And I took a flight from Rio across the Amazon. And back then in 1992, you could fly for maybe four hours with unbroken rainforest. And when I returned just before Christmas, there was two hours over degraded ranches before you hit the rainforest. So you see in a relatively short space of time, you know, in my, sort of my lifetime, the last 30 years or across my career, how nature has been eroded and how kind of wildlife has been marginalized in lots of places. For you, Brian, as well, wild Africa is in your blood. Your father was, if he was the first biologist in Botswana and Zimbabwe, is that right? Yeah, my dad started his career rescuing animals when they flooded Lake Kariba in 1955. He did his PhD on that and then he was employed by the United Nations mm -hmm. to set up the Protected Area Agency in Botswana. So I pretty much grew up 
in rural areas, in villages of, I don't know, a couple of people mm-hmm. and on the back of a Land Rover. But what, what Shylock was saying is we saw that the that wonderful environment was being replaced by what we call low-value farming. We also saw high-value wildlife was being replaced by low-value farming, mainly because of bad conservation policy, mm-hmm. Western conservation policy, which works in America but not in Africa. Yeah. What you see happening in Brazil, the, the, the moving away of the Amazon, what we're seeing in Southern Africa is that boundary starting to move back and more wildlife occurring. And if we could trade and use wildlife and we didn't have to fight all these special interest groups, we could probably treble what we're doing. What, what do you mean by special interest groups? A lot of wildlife policy is decided at uh, highly centralized forums like IUCN, CITES, CBD. Small special interest groups can organize and can have a big influence at a central place, and they raise a lot of money out of it. So you've got a few urban people imposing their worldview onto rural people. Mm -hmm. So Shylock, you're working directly with rural communities using a tool called a governance dashboard. This is an approach where you're able to collect data and then sit with the community to discuss the issues that exist. The idea is that they can then be empowered to collectively identify solutions rather than feeling disempowered by external events or forces. This is something that you and Brian have been working on for some years, and it takes a participatory democracy approach to problem solving, giving villagers the right to speak for matters they have a stake in. But in terms of the data that you're using to inform this, what is it that you measure and how how do you collect that data? Is it going out into communities and speaking with people face to face? Yeah, so I think I'll start from the end. There are a lot of assumptions that we impose when we work on communities. And our work from 2007 to date actually shows otherwise, right? We last did the dashboard in 2011, 2012, thereabout. Uh, But we've got one community that took up the method and they've been implementing it for a good 10 years now on their own without our interference. So with the dashboard, what we're doing is we are working with the community in deciding what to measure. So all we do is we facilitate that process. This is around a specific theme. How can we enhance the governance of your conservancy, of your community? How can we improve your wildlife program? So people then decide what to measure. Uh, We facilitate that process. We train them on the methods for collecting data. So we we sort of blending our science practitioner because most of the time you're dealing with not very highly educated people, but they're very effective because I think the subject in question is things that concern their life. They collect the data, bring back the data. Before we punch it into any software, we're sitting through every questionnaire looking at the responses, helping tally those questions. We then ask them to do the graphs and try and explain what that data means. They then take this data and present it at a general meeting. So we invite the leaders, we're inviting the conservancy staff, other participating NGOs, because the dashboard touched on a lot of issues. And in the in that meeting, they're using data to solve their problem. So it's not about, hey, you are doing this or you're doing this, but it's saying, okay, based on this extensive consultation, this is what is coming out. So what are the actions? So what then happens is that data informs an action plan. But what we've seen is once you are able to get to that point of people rec- recognizing that their system has got challenges through evidence, through data, it's easy to move from a problem to a solution to an action plan. Our success case, uh, we're hoping we'll meet up this winter, this summer in Namibia and and follow up on this fantastic case on Paro. But in short, that's what the dashboard means. So once you've got these areas that need attention, the next thing is specific groups of people are then sitting together again collectively to work out the solutions We've got a lot of of findings, 
across the different communities in Zambia, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, South Africa, Mozambique, and so on. So the background to this is that if you read the literature or go to many community programs, they always say the performance is not up to the standard of the promise of community-based conservation. And the biggest problem they're facing is elite capture. The money disappears or is not used. What we found is that that is a misdesign because what's happening is all the NGOs are essentially, I call them lazy. They set up a committee and they assume that through an election every three or four years, that committee is accountable to the people. That's clearly a false assumption. Yet millions and millions of dollars are invested in what we call committee-based management. So we've done some experiments, almost by accident. We started working with communities, and we structured them so they made decisions as in ancient Greece, all sitting together in a circle. And we found that that outperformed the committee-based management by a factor of 10 to 40. Mm -hmm. So, for example, where I worked in Zambia, in committee-based management, 40 to 80% of the money is not properly accounted for. When you work at the village level less than 1% is not accounted for. And the communities love it. Because essentially what the committee-based management is doing, it's reinforcing the colonial, post-colonial, top-down control systems of how do you control people. Yep. So what, we, what we're actually doing is following Ostrom. And, and part of CBRM is radical democratization. And with that democratization, we've also measured things like in villages, social capital, trust, ability to work together, and variables like this. And if you do it through the village, face-to-face, -face, those variables improve really rapidly. On the ground, when this initiative first began, were people kind of open to it straight away? Because you're, you're, I suppose you're, it's about change. You're trying to change that hegemony. So, Shylock, did you find that kind of people were suspicious or reluctant to that change, or did they say straight away, this is exactly what we need? Obviously, we didn't get a uniform response. What I really want to, to highlight is, at times, a lot of the change is restricted not from within the communities. You've got NGOs, the special interest group that Brian has talked about. But this process was sort of widely accepted uh, in, in Namibia and, and the rest of the places. Some of the leaders did not understand it. And good thing we've got on our team People who naturally work with traditional leaders, with, we've got politicians on the team. We're able to negotiate, break down, and explain these things to, to the traditional leaders so that they see a positive spin in the things that we're doing. So if it's, it's interpreted as directly, I'm going to lose power, I'm going to lose control, and so on, uh, you would find some people would, 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 would want to resist that. Mm -hmm. but, but overall, I think 80, 85% we got initial acceptance. Yeah, but like I'm saying, um, we've got several cases of external actors coming and saying, no, you can't go this way, either it's a government department, because they're used to doing this work in, uh, in a regular way. They don't want change, so they resist that change. It radically motivates communities. You can tell a community that's participatory from democracy just by how straight they walk and how many things they do. In the area I worked in Zambia, the community developed 150 projects when it was theirs, compared to 10 the other way around. And they all knew what was going on. There's a level of leaders, and the leaders have been empowered by the old extractive non-democratic system. And the people under them is who we're empowering. The data from Mozambique, Shylock, shows that the empowerment of people is six times more valuable than the money. And that's the first time we've actually got a number that we can measure it with. If you're going to representational community, people are suspicious. Somebody's stolen the money. What happened to the cement? We don't trust the leader. But when they meet face to face, you don't have those problems. Yeah. And I suppose as communities see the benefits that CBNRM brings, there will be more people on board with that. And um, can you get, share some examples of how communities have kind of made an impact through harnessing CBNRM? I think what we've had happen is a massive cultural shift 
in communities around Southern Africa, if you ask them, how tolerant are you of lions and leopards and buffalo? They're very tolerant. Whereas you see farmers in Switzerland and Norway and Idaho wanting to kill wolves. Africans are not like that. They are much more tolerant towards wildlife. I still think we have a huge way to go in terms of income because communities are getting about a dollar per hectare and the private sector is getting about $20 per hectare. So we can still, we've got a long way to go on the benefits. In Zambia, you'll see communities moving to make space for wildlife. When I lived in Zambia, there was definitely an increase in wildlife and a significant reduction in poaching because of social pressure. If you look in Namibia, the wildlife populations are way higher than they were when this started 20 years ago. So yeah, the things are positive. I think we're about 10% of the way towards to where we could get. And I'll let uh, Sherlock carry on from there. This is a very important question, Gordon, and I hope we can pr bring a lot of clarity to to this whole question of CBNR and benefits. Th there is a strong tendency in the literature to measure what people can quantify, right? So how much money has gone in, how, how many uh, elephants do you have over and above that? But, I mean, CBNRM is, has been building the social fabric of communities. We can argue whether that can be quantified or not. But let me give you an example. We've got communities who, over the past 30, 35 years, the government has not been able to build a clinic. So the community went ahead and built a clinic. You reduce maternal mortality. Conservationists usually don't even come and measure that. We've been doing a lot of measurement around the region with, with Brian, where we're realizing a lot of the things that we're measuring and quantifying and trying to relate that to CBNRM, we are missing a lot of things. So I've just given you one example. Let me give you another one. And, and if we need to discuss, we can discuss that. We now have a cadre of politicians, MPs, councillors, and all that who didn't even go to school. Thanks to the CBNRM programs, these communities build schools, and we now have MPs who've been promoted through the CBNRM track. They are now sitting in parliament. They're advocating for the rights of their communities. They're articulating what it means to live with wildlife. We've had communities that are paying university education for their children. Something that government won't be able to do, something that NGOs are not able to do. But these guys have been doing it with the little money that we're advocating. So like Brian says, the reason why we keep arguing that we need to channel a lot more money to these communities is because we know, yes, some of it uh, uh, gets captured, it leaks, but the bulk of it, where it's invested, it makes a huge difference. CBNRM is about lives, and it's been sort of a backbone for so many communities, millions and millions, beyond the dollar that we measure, beyond the, the meat that we measure. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the benefits of CBNRM, they can be quantified, yeah, there's a lot that we miss just by focusing on the numbers. At the at the bottom of it, it's transformed a lot of my brothers and sisters' lives who would have their lives would have taken a different trajectory where it's not this investment that's come through CBNRM. What's really happened is communities have gone from being wildlife criminals and rejected by the state and rejected by society to be the shepherds of the environment and respected. So Going from being a criminal to being a shepherd psychologically is an enormous thing. Secondly, they've got organized. I was speaking to one of the guys from Mahenye. He said, we've got three doctors and two lawyers came through the, the school. And that's actually providing probably more income than the, the wildlife did. But they would never have gone out and they never have made it without the wildlife. So for me, it's re we're rebuilding the respect and the organization of communities that have been smashed up by 400 years of oppression. Yeah, but it's just about the kind of simple principles of, of democratizing communities, providing education, the things that people around the world generally take, take for granted. And Brian, you said earlier on that you, you felt that you've achieved 10% of what you, you feel you can. Have you got a time scale that you think you're going to be able to achieve all that you can out of this initiative? We had rapid change in the 90s, and then we've had like almost 20 years of stagnation. 
and we have a new generation of very talented young people coming through. What, what I'm talking about doing is developing a $30 billion vision. Because technically, we're probably earning 2 to $3 billion in Southern Africa. We could easily earn $30 billion. And if we that and that's going from one dollar to ten dollars per hectare, we can go to twenty. So what we now need to do is sell that vision and grab onto it and move past it. But unfortunately, a lot of our energy gets distracted from fighting these so-called environmental groups that are supposed to be on our side because they keep trying to close down the markets. Um, so you're making connections with communities in Africa but I think sort of the, the 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 other bridges that have to be built is kind of with people living in sort of UK and America as last night for example I was um uh, I was a little forum and somebody asked my, my views on trophy hunting in Africa and people were aghast when I sort of expressed that you know in some cases this can can work and if it is a way of protecting wildlife and wild wild places that is that is a good thing and um thankfully the night came to a fairly fairly short end so I didn't have to kind of overly justify myself but yeah I think that is this sort of there's that disconnect that people have with with nature maybe we don't have to domesticate the whole planet we could rewild the planet and create more livelihoods mm -hmm. but we've got to get this western preoccupation with using nature as bad out of the way because it's blocking the westerners getting from what they're getting what they want and that and that's a major psychological thing so like our communities have gone from wildlife being bad to wildlife being good the western urban people I think need to start to recognize that if you only if you only eat domestic crops you're only going to have a domestic planet. Mm -hmm. Shylock for you you have been on the ground and so locally you can see this empowerment in local communities. What's your vision for the future in in southern african communities but also globally what do you what do you hope the future will look like? A future where there is room for polarity, multiple ideas, where the rights of local communities are respected. What Brian is saying is now we've got a lot of domestic packages. And guess what, Gordon? I grew up seeing wildlife, but I have to now pay for my child to go and watch wildlife. So, it, so, so the world has changed in that respect. And I think when we started the show, I told you I, I live a dual life urban and rural if i don't go to my rural area then my mom will call me and say what are you wanting to become so these rural landscapes where nature thrives and so on they are an embodiment of who we are i think that would be a beautiful future where these rural landscapes are allowed to thrive based on our local knowledge based on locally uh, driven driven models and for the world to respect that those choices that we are making link back to the history of African people living alongside wildlife, hunting, as well as earning a living from it. With COVID, uh, we've seen a lot of people moving back into the rural areas, moving back into these wildlands, reconnecting. I know there's a Zimbabwe now who is taking it to extremities. He lives in a place where there's no electricity and so on. He's got in a place somewhere there in Binga, but very highly educated. So so why are people doing that? They are reconnecting with the essence of Ubuntu, if I would say. So there's no future for Africa, particularly for us here in Southern Africa, that it doesn't include the world, that uh, doesn't give room for our wildlife to thrive. It's an identity for, for most of the people, especially when you link it to totems, religious rites, how people believe, some believe, pray, and, and, and worship. I live a dual life too. I live in the West and I live in rural areas. And what I see where I live around here is we've lost our social capital. We don't know our neighbors. We all have depression and psychological illnesses. And if you've got a problem, you don't go to your neighbors. You call some institution. And... I think the West is really struggling. Whereas if we can rebuild rural communities as, and I'm not saying small villages are the most comfortable things because there's gossiping, but if we can connect, keep that connectedness of people, in some ways we can 
have more social capital and maybe less consumptive capital. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a renaissance or a return to a healthy way of living in a society that was not just good for people, but good for a natural environment as well. It is certainly so much food for thought. I think if we are going to have natural resources, if we as a species are going to have a future, it has to be about empowerment and people actually sort of and about democracy and, and communities having that ability to make decisions for their future and for the health of their families and for the health of their societies into the future. Thank you both so very much. This has been, it's been fantastic speaking to you to both. That really is a powerful conversation to pause on for now. It's been truly fascinating to understand the extent to which research and data can help inform communities who are using a participatory democracy model to rebuild social value and become stewards of their land again. It's also caused me to reflect upon the vast and perhaps oversimplified legacy of colonial land practices attitudes and laws in traditional conservation. But by working from a bottom-up community level and returning rights to people, it sounds like there's an enormous amount of change that can be enacted to build social capital in communities living with wildlife and encourage sustainable use models to thrive fast. Thank you so very much to Brian and Shylock for joining me. If you'd like to find out more about Brian and Shylock's work, take a look at the links in the show notes or just visit the website jamainternational.com to explore more amazing international collaborations. Make sure you follow or subscribe to this podcast on your favourite app. JAMA International are passionate about conservation and well-being for people and planet. And they know it's crucial to open positive dialogues and share ideas. If you'd like to share this podcast, please do so with the hashtag beneath the Baobab on social media. Baobab is spelled B-A-O-B-A-B, but you knew that. Or perhaps just start a conversation with a friend, a neighbour, or a complete stranger. I'm Gordon Buchanan, and you've been listening to Beneath the Baobab.